Hi there! Welcome to History in Retrograde. This is the podcast where we use the ancient art of astrology to help us better understand the past. I'm your co-host, Chandler O'Quinn, and joining us live via satellite is my mom. Hi, Mom! Hi, Chandler! Are you ready to begin another grand experiment? Absolutely. I love doing this with you. (laughs) All right, let's begin. So, uh, for those of you just joining us, the way that this works is you, the listening and viewing audience, already know who our mystery history guest is. It's in the title of today's episode. I, of course, know because I selected this historical figure. But Mom has no idea who this person might be. In a moment, I will give her the birthplace, date, and time of this historical figure. She will then input that information into the back computer, and out will come the astrological birth chart of that historical figure, where all the stars and planets and moons were at the moment that that person was born. She will then give us an initial reading, uh, pointing out all of the uh, personality, characteristics, motivations, uh, fortunes of this person, And then later on, I will reveal who our mystery history guest is, uh, give a little bit of background about them, and we will discuss how accurate the chart represents uh, what that person did, and if it can give us any insight uh, that we didn't previously know about that person. So, without further ado, let us begin. Uh, This is going to be a female. Okay. uh, Born... Uh, the 17th of okay. September. Okay. 1122 JUL, meaning the Julian calendar. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm going to go with this time that I found of 320 p.m. Ooh. So that's very interesting that they have a time. Yeah, I uh the the this being someone from the twelfth century, um there are lots of discussions about whether this is the correct date, this is the correct time. I found three secondary sources uh with this date and time on there. Um, and we are a podcast, uh, not an academic journal, so <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and roll with it and see what happens. Okay. Uh, the country is France. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, the town is Poitiers, P-O-I-T-I-E-R-S. Right. Poitiers. Uh-huh. All right. Let's give it a whirl. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh. Wow. Okay. Uh. Let me make this bigger. Let me just look at this for a minute. Well, uh, this person also has a very dynamic chart. Uh, when you have this many planets and north node in a particular house, it doesn't matter which house it would be, that would be very significant. Um, in the past, we've done people who had a number of planets in one quadrant. This person seems to have a lot of planets in this quadrant. Um, Okay, uh, let's start this one with the 11th house. Chiron in 
Sagittarius in the 11th house. I want to start with this because I recently did more research on Chiron. I was not originally uh, trained uh, with much information about Chiron, but it is the um, wounded healer. It represents, sorry for that background, that is the standard poodle. It represents the wounded healer. Oh my. Um, yeah, we're going to have to pause. Well, what does, what does Yippie, Yippie have to say about Yippie is very animated about this, so I'm not going to turn anything off. I'm just going to let it roll, and I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Yippie, I'm in the middle of a podcast! This is not okay! All right, so the Wounded Healer. I think it's very interesting, and in I want to start out with that this time, because basically it means that this is a place where you have karma, you have a natural wound that you come into this life with. And if you do what you're supposed to do, you will either gain the knowledge to heal this wound, or you will gain the knowledge to help other people heal this wound, right? Okay, so in this situation, this person has the wounded healer in the 11th house, which is the house of groups and, and, and friends and gatherings, right? So this person would have come mm -hmm. in, and it's in Sagittarius, okay, which is... Sagittarius is, of course, the natural hunter. It's very natural uh, uh, appreciation of nature and animals and philosophy and travel, uh, all those things and more. But in this particular situation, this person would have come into this life with a, an issue in that area, which they would have had to heal. So this is a person who needs to heal groups of people. That's one of the missions, okay? So that's kind of a mission like we've discussed okay. North Node before, okay? So mm -hmm. I also want to go to um, this Pluto conjunct Jupiter. Well, it's not, it's not in the same... Thing, but it is they're both in the same house right pluto and jupiter in the third house mm -hmm. so this person has pluto in taurus and jupiter in taurus oh they are okay they're just a little bit far apart okay so having pluto conjunct jupiter first of all is going to give you an extreme amount of power in your home in your home area okay very much mm -hmm. power in your home area um it doesn't have to be in, I mean, I think perhaps it could be connected in some way to this and maybe this North Node. So this, these three things are very powerful for this person. So the, uh, the Chiron, the North Node, and the Pluto uh -huh, conjunct I think, I Jupiter. I mean, not to mention all the rest of it, but these okay. things are sort of right. um, power. Pluto is power. It's also death and rebirth. It just mm -hmm. depends on where you are, where your transits are, what's happening in your life. It can either be very powerful or it can um, create a situation where you're in a constant loop of death and rebirth, death and rebirth, death and rebirth, or it can make you very powerful. With Jupiter there, it seems like it would make you very powerful. And um, mm -hmm. I think that it would be... Uh, very, 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 feeling very home, very, you know, like brothers and sisters, um, power for the, I don't know how to, power for the brothers and sisters. I, I, I that's what I'm feeling. What about a, a clan? Yeah, anything that feels like family. Anything that feels sibling-like. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh... Moon in the second house. Moon in the second house could give this person uh, 
emotional ties to material things. Could be material things. Could be um, maybe the mother has a very good amount of money. Or there's second house things. Second house is usually finances and, um, uh, you know, like luxuries and money flow and things like that. This person has moon in Pisces. Okay. Having that moon in Pisces, uh, anything that's in Pisces, it's going to make them kind of psychic. Um, open to, mm -hmm. um, open to things that are not the norm. People who have, people who are Pisces, people who have planets in Pisces, wherever you're going to find those planets in Pisces is where you're going to find, uh, an, an openness to supernatural things or, um, abilities that they might have. They might have, uh, natural healing abilities. It could be something as simple as having the gift of being able to say something to someone and make them feel better. Or it could be mm -hmm. real, really healing abilities, real um, psychic abilities. Maybe healing would be more Fergonian, but I think anything Pisces has to do with kind of the supernatural. Sorry about that. Um, so there's that. Okay. Um, now... Moving around. Also, this person has um, Capricorn rising, but it's Capricorn. It's barely has Capricorn. Uh, with the rest of this chart, I would almost want to say that this person has almost like has Aquarius rising. And it wouldn't make anything change too much in the chart if they did. But it seems like this person might be more humanitarian than... Um, mm -hmm. um, super uh I, I don't know maybe this person is very attached to material things and very into the art of the deal and business and things like that but or appears that way but i don't know why i just want to lean mm -hmm. towards perhaps the exact time of birth is off a little bit or maybe we're calculating that time of birth off because of how old it is or something but i just get the feeling that this person would have more of a humanitarian appearance or people would see them that way i don't know though because this person per this chart with with the time of birth has in the seventh house has saturn in the seventh house uh in leo at six degrees uh with uranus at 22 degrees so that's saturn uranus and what is this mercury in virgo Hmm, in the seventh house. Ah, uh, this person would be forceful and have great leadership abilities because anything that has to do with Leo is going to be leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And has, this is the lesson this person has to learn Maybe this person has to learn how to be the leader in partnerships because seventh house is partnerships. Seventh okay. house is partnerships of, um, of, uh, couples, but it can also be business partnerships. Anything that you have a distinct partner with, um, this person should be fairly precise at being able to communicate having mercury in mercury is your communications and having it in virgo or gemini gives you a leg up on how you communicate i would assume that where people with mercury and gemini would be a little bit more um airy in their language a little more um disconnected not not extremely so because they're well known for their communication abilities but 
compared to a Virgo, a Mercury in Virgo, would be much more precise, more information, more uh, details, you know. So this person should have been a, a, a very good communicator. Um, all this in the eighth house. So much in the eighth house. Eighth house is inheritance, family inheritance, legacy, lots of legacy. It's ruled by Scorpio, mm -hmm. okay? So it can be dangerous or it can be, it could be, uh, it could be sexual, but it's not in this case because it's not ruled by Scorpio. Like if it was double Scorpio, it would be bad. But this is just eighth house, which is ruled by uh, Virgo Libra, okay? So more uh, what do I want to say more so much precision north node in Virgo in the 8th house Neptune in Virgo all these planets in Virgo healing Virgo is healing in that Virgo is a medicine right Virgo is about mm -hmm. healing and medicine. Something to do with medicine. Or, but it could also be details and communications. But Mars in Libra, again, that justice weighing of the scales this is something like a legacy with weighing of the scales like a legacy of justice venus in libra venus and mars in libra mm. in the eighth house but that's also sexual it could be sexual Ooh, this one's got me a little bit stumped chandler uh sun in libra sun but see, all this Libra gives you so much beauty and like almost poetic, um, <laughs> the ability to, uh, I almost want to say the ability to manifest beauty, but it's also ruled by Scorpio. So it's death and rebirth, death and rebirth. Uh, Neptune in Virgo and North Node in Virgo. Uh, this one has, am I getting anything right? It, I feel like I'm just swimming around here because there's so many options to this one where sometimes I'll see it and it's just like cut and dried, but this one feels, um, like it could go a couple of different ways. Am I hitting on anything? Yeah, you're hitting on, on some definite, uh, uh, uh characteristics that that um this person had um i think that uh, uh yeah just keep going because the, the so far i haven't put anything in the in the doesn't quite make so much sense column i think that uh there's some like uh that there are aspects that maybe we just didn't know about this person but um the I, I I'm not sure if if healing is something that is necessarily associated with her, but uh, it's very possible that that's just a part of her private experience that wasn't uh, really written or or didn't she didn't become well known like for it. um Virgo is also work okay let's go this direction Virgo means work Virgos will work um Virgos will work a million hours uh as a really good hard worker uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to having a Capricorn who will figure out how to get other people to do it. <laughs> so this person okay. is very dedicated to their work. And in this case, it would be very dedicated to this legacy, this, this intense need to create this way or legacy. Yeah. Um, having Neptune there in Virgo 
at, you see how these are three degrees apart? That's going to yeah. give this person a very odd situation with their life goal. Meaning, somehow, because Neptune is ruled by Pisces. I mean, Neptune is ruled, uh, blah. Uh, Pisces is ruled by Neptune, right? So Neptune is creativity and, and psychic ability and, and imagination and insanity. It could be all those things, right? So it can okay. make you... Having this be this connected to your north node could make your goals seem dreamy or um, imaginary or uh, many different many different aspects of um, I mean it could make this person I don't know like kind of kind of crazy maybe but not necessarily because Neptune can be pure psychic ability so having this conjunct this if it were someone that I thought was super psychic and used that ability to move forward then this that that would be a great thing for those two right there and then the, all of this justice and you know uh Mars being the direction, you know, and having it in Libra in the eighth house. There's a lot of, uh, I would assume, um, driven to justice. And it's just within them, like, you know, all these planets in Libra. This is, I mean, I wouldn't mind hanging out with this person. I would be, I would be like totally mm -hmm. cool with hanging out with this person. Yeah, I, I, think you would. <laughs> I think that this person has a lot of passionate um, qualities for good and mm -hmm. a need to heal the people at her home. And I'm not sure about this situation with second house moon in the second house but i really feel that this should be up here that this person probably wouldn't have had but i don't know because capricorn capricorn also represents like very religious people is this a very religious person um Occasionally, yeah, I would, th I would think, yeah, that a religion did did play a pretty important part in their life. Well, I think. Let me see. See, this Pluto also could be. Mm, bad things could happen at the home. But I'm gonna say this: this is a very fierce person. This is, a, I want to say this person is very fierce. They're not always able, but they have to learn that, right? Through partners. Mm -hmm. What are they not well, able? Well, here's the thing. Saturn is your kind of like, it can be like your Achilles heel. It's what you have to learn. It is the lesson you have to learn. You have to learn this, right? So, mm -hmm. do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, so how would this person deal with power? Honestly, I think that this person, I, I want to say that this person would, I'm going to put, I'm going to put it this way. On the one hand, this person can be deadly. And on the other hand, this person can rule fairly. Does that make sense? Like, this is a mm -hmm. fierce, yes. fair ruler. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Yes, it makes so a lot I, of sense. I mean, I would like to hang out with this person because I'd be like, wow, this is going to uh, be cool. You are, you are pretty yes. cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh -huh. she was very cool. Um, uh, how would this person uh, respond to men? Uh, well, her Mars is in Libra. 
in the new house. So that could go a lot of different ways. Because the eighth house is the house of sexuality. Um, she could be pretty tense with men. Um, but it isn't Libra. So, I don't know. She could even maybe not like men. I'm just saying, like, Libra. She could like women. I don't know. Um, okay. But I would say that as far as... Are you talking about a romantic relationship with men? I'm talking about in general. I mean, we're dealing with a woman who is... Uh, living in 12th century medieval mm -hmm. Europe, uh, that is a very yeah, male-dominated... Yeah, I don't dominated... think this woman has any regard for that. I don't think this woman... Okay. And if she does, she's pretending. Meaning, like, in this time period, she would know enough to know that she would have to pretend to be this in order to do that. But honestly, okay. I just get the feeling from her that she has no regard. She's going to do what she wants. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Could be wrong. I, I'm always like, well, I don't know. This one's, this one's interesting, very interesting. But I, I, I feel intuitively that I totally like to hang out with this chick. She would be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and earlier you were talking about uh, partnerships and couples. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, person would be best to? Should she be in a partnership? Well, you know, with? whenever you have your uh, seventh house, whatever's on your seventh house, which here she has, Le she has a Leo on her seventh house, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean who you want to be with, because for a woman who likes men, then she's going to want someone who is more like her Mars, right? But... <laughs> Um, what does that mean? Mars is for, for women who are heterosexual, you are looking, the, the man that you're looking for is your, your Mars points to that, right? So this is, her Mars is in Libra. Okay. And that leads mm -hmm. her to a man that is, um, more, uh, Actually, Libra men are, are they they like really nice things. They like beautiful things. Um, they normally are very handsome uh, along that line. But I don't know that this woman would be happy with a man that wasn't at least as powerful as her and more than mm -hmm. likely would really be attracted to a man who was more powerful than her. But did not use that power against her. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So she could be this. I feel like this woman's got a lot of power to begin with. So I don't know if she just came into it. Like she was born into it from her mother. I don't know, but um, she's okay. I, she's just really super cool. Uh, how would men view her? Well, if she does have this Capricorn rising, men would not... It, I mean, it just depends. Like, if, if this is for real, then a, ca a person who has Capricorn rising is usually very attractive, very classy looking. Not cheap. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, <laughs> not um, you know, never a floozy. But like along the men would revere her. Does that make any sense? Uh, I feel like whenever women have Capricorn rising and when they do the thing they do, which makes them look the best they look. How can I put this? Um, let's say for a woman uh, applying your makeup, doing your hair, choosing the outfit, this is all very ritualistic for them. This is not necessarily... I mean, mm -hmm. for some women, I guess, they do it for men or to get men's attention. But most women do it for themselves. They do it because they are empowering themselves, however they like. Some women do it with false eyelashes. Some women do it by going and running a marathon. It just depends on what you're doing. But in a, with a Capricorn rising person, they have a way of putting themselves together 
that is uh, stunning. They can be stunning. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, how, how would this person respond to challenges, uh, things that obstacles in their way? <laughs> um, that goes back over to the Mars, I think. Obstacles. I think in a way this person would be level-headed about it, but... That doesn't mean this person would not use force or be very fierce in what they were doing. They, mm -hmm. I don't think that they would get hot-headed about it. I don't think they would get, uh, you know, all frothy or cry. I think they would be, um, they might almost try to negotiate first. And then when that didn't work, you better be ready. <laughs> okay. But also, this person could use... This person could manipulate and use their sexuality if they wanted to. With this eighth house, ruled by Scorpio, this person could have a very good handle on using that aspect of their personality to 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 get what they want and i want to say they get what they want for like the people or their home or whatever does that make sense okay mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah uh so are there uh any other things that that strike you as uh interesting about this chart uh, before we reveal i believe anything? that this person came into this life with the with wanting to learn how to lead. I believe that this person okay. knew when they chose to come into this life that they were going to be a leader and that they were going to do it to the best of their ability. And, uh, you know, if, if the uh, concept is true that we know before we are incarnated into a lifetime what we want to do, and what lessons we need to work on. I believe that this person was very feminine. Um, mm -hmm. Most likely. Most li I, don't th I don't think this person was gay. But maybe. I mean, who cares if they are? But, um, yeah, I think this person was a remarkable leader. And uh, most likely a legacy. E everybody mm -hmm. should know who this person is, whoever they are. Uh, well, let me uh, summarize some of the uh, points uh, that you uh, were reading. Uh, so first thing, um, needs to heal groups of people. Uh, power in home area. Uh, open to things that are not the norm. Uh, an emotional tie to wealth. Humanitarian, forceful leadership. Uh, learn leadership in partnerships, inheritance, legacy, and a legacy of justice, beauty, poetic, sexual, dedicated to legacy, hard worker, creative, fierce, feminine. That all mm -hmm. track, that everything, mm -hmm. uh, anything I've left um, out from I, this I, summary? I'm sure that you said about the... Um needing to heal the the groups yes but starting yeah. out at the downside of that like having to come up above that and 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 go through the wounded part to get to the healing part all right are you ready to yes find out whose yes. chart you've been looking at this is the astrological birth chart of Eleanor <gasps> of Aquitaine. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah, I'd totally like to hang out with her. That would be amazing. So, 
not exactly sure how familiar uh, we are. Our education system doesn't really focus on uh, 12th century uh, uh, medieval European at all, and especially not ruling women. Um, but Eleanor of Aquitaine, I would say for my two cents, is one of the most influential, one of the most important people, human beings of the last millennium. Uh, and and then the fact that she is a woman makes it so much more amazing, the things that she did in her life. Uh, I will not be able to really even get to the uh, cover the entire tip of the iceberg in the time that we have together right now. I will give you a few of the career highlights, and I will just encourage anyone listening, viewing this, to do your own research, look up documentaries and movies and books about this amazing, amazing, powerful woman. Uh, Eleanor uh, of Aquitaine uh, was born in 1122 in Poitiers, France. Uh, she was the only surviving heir to William X, Duke of Aquitaine. Uh, as such, uh, she would inherit one of the most valuable duchies in all of Christendom. So today, uh, you know, we, we think of France as being pretty much that whole uh, uh, northwest corner of uh, Europe. Uh, but in uh, the 12th century, um, France, uh, the Kingdom of France, was really just the area right around Paris. Uh, there were still large swaths of modern-day France that were still somewhat independent. Uh, so Normandy, Anjou, uh, uh, Gascony, Burgundy. Of all of these, Aquitaine would be the largest, the most valuable uh, piece of of. Uh, 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 property in modern day France. Uh, and, and back then, she was set to inherit it all. And um, not only was she already given this uh, amazing inheritance, uh, as part of being Aquitanian, this is the time of the great troubadours um, of courtly love, and Aquitaine was really seen as this hub of of the troubadours. Uh, their, uh, her grandfather uh, was one of the first troubadours, so the songs and the poems that we have this time are really important. It's a very creative area of the world, um, and as she was growing up, she was very well educated, could speak multiple languages, uh, knew philosophy and literature, astrology, astronomy, science, as it was back then. Um, she's one of the only women uh, that when you go to her mausoleum, there is a statue of her reading Ooh, a book. I want to go to that. This is a time period when not only could not, most men were not taught how to read, uh, nobody, I mean, it, it was very rare. Uh, and, and for her to be a woman who everyone knew how important her education and how much of an intellectual giant she was, that when she was buried, she's buried holding a book. Um, that is very striking. So... We have the most uh, important land uh, that she's going to be ruling over. She is one of the most intellectual, smart women of the time. And according to all records, she was quite a good looking <laughs> uh, She could really turn some heads. So she was a, a, a power package here. Uh, and... Uh, of the time, the what women were supposed to do were to get married and uh, sure up alliances. And so uh, William, uh, Duke of Aquitaine, set up a marriage between her and Louis, uh, who would become the King of France. Uh, so Louis the Seventh. Uh, what I think is really important about this is that there's almost like what we would consider a, a prenup in the fact that... Um, she would remain being the Duchess of Aquitaine. It would not just be automatically assumed into the French kingdom until she had a son, and that son would become the King of France. So until that son of hers would become the King of France, she was in charge of the Aquitaine, not her husband. 
And her father was the one who made that happen. Uh, so this is, you know, for, for medieval Europe, that, that's a pretty striking and, and, and uh, uh, progressive thing in, in our eyes today uh, that uh, her father would do that and recognize the power and the intellect that she had, that she was capable of doing that. Uh, so she was uh, married in 1137. And Louis was a, uh, she would often say afterwards that she married a monk, <laughs> uh, not a monarch. Uh, he was a very pious man. Uh, religion and spirituality played a very important part in his life. Um, very calm and subdued, um, a scholastic uh, uh, even, but not, not energetic, not vivacious. Um, it would take them eight years to have their first child. Uh, that child would be a girl. Um, and then in 1147, uh, there was a call made to go on a second crusade. Uh, so the first crusade uh, was fought in the 1090s uh, by the European powers to go take over the Holy Land from uh, the Seljuk Turks. And they were successful in taking lots of the little kingdoms uh, in the Levant um, and so 50 years later, uh, one of these kingdoms had been retaken by the Turks, uh, Edessa, and uh, that was the kingdom that was taken. And so then on uh, March 31st of 1147, uh, if I could travel back in time to see one event in the 12th century, this would be it. Uh, so on March 31st, uh, Eleanor and Louis and a few hundred of their closest friends uh, went to uh, Vézelay's. Uh, uh, excuse my uh, pronunciation. I took eight years of Latin and no years of French, so I uh, may be butchering that. But uh, went to Vézelay's to pledge themselves uh, to fight on this crusade. And uh, the one they were pledging themselves to was a man named Bernard of Clairvaux. And he really uh, whipped up the crowd to go and fight uh, in the Second Crusade. Uh, he, you know, talking about the glory of their uh, grandfathers in the 1090s who had gone over to the Holy Land and taken it for Christendom. And uh, he gave such a great speech that everyone there wanted to pledge themselves to fight in this Second Crusade. And he brought crosses for everyone to wear. Uh, because this is a thing, it's a, it's a, essentially an excursion that is uh, a sanctioned by the church. You are fighting for Christ to go over to the Holy Land and do uh, all the battles over there. So he's passing out the crosses to all these people, and eventually he runs out of crosses. And so he takes his own robe off and starts ripping his robe to make more crosses to give to people so that they can go on this journey. And as part of this, Eleanor pledged herself. She took up a cross for herself. And what is so amazing about this is that she was not taking up a cross as the Queen of France. She took up a cross as Duchess of the Aquitaine. Uh, meaning that she was not someone's mm -hmm. wife. She was a ruler yes. herself going over to uh, 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 fight That's for Christendom. That's awesome. And, and so she brought uh, all of her ladies-in-waiting and 300 vassals from the Aquitaine with her uh, to uh, go uh, to the Holy Land. Uh, there are so many stories that come uh, from this uh, part of her life. Now, there... There's, you know, modern day historians are a little uh, fuzzy on whether all these are true, but they she certainly led a life to where people would believe that they were true. One of these stories is that as they are riding into Constantinople, at this time it is Constantinople, mm -hmm. not Istanbul, Constantinople, and uh, they uh, she was riding at the head of her army with all of her ladies maids, and they were riding bare breasts. Oh my. Uh, at, uh -huh, and and uh, as as Amazon warriors, inheritance of this Amazon uh, 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 legacy, and uh, riding bare-breasted into Constantinople, uh, she was clearly a very effective leader. Um, her husband, on the other hand, was not. Again, he was more of a preacher than than a fighter. He made a lot of tactical mistakes. Um, 
Eventually, uh, they get to Antioch. Uh, Antioch uh, was ruled by Eleanor's uncle, uh, Raymond. Uh, Raymond wants to use the French troops to go and take Aleppo and then take Edessa. Uh, so he convinces Eleanor to do this, and then Eleanor tries to talk Louis into it, and Louis doesn't want to. Now, what's you know striking about this is that the whole point of this crusade was to take Edessa, and this is the you know the opportunity laying right here for Louis to to try and do that, and he refuses. He instead he wants to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to the Holy Land and where the places that Jesus walked and 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 pledge himself uh, uh, to. Uh, Christianity there, he's not so much interested in, you know, the whole point of the actual crusade of traveling mm-hmm. all these miles. Uh, Eleanor's very upset about this and uh, refuses to go with him to Jerusalem. Not only does she refuse to go with Louis to Jerusalem, she says, in fact, this whole thing isn't working out. Uh, we need to oh! get a divorce. And the reason that we need to get a divorce is consanguinity. Uh, we are related <gasps> to each other. Now, everyone now knows that all of the royals are related to each other. They all married to each other to try and keep the bloodlines pure. Uh, and this was not unheard of in the fact of, you know, relationships being annulled by the Pope for consanguinity. What is so striking about this is that she's the one who's doing it. Consanguinity was this clause that kings and dukes and lords would go to the pope and say, hey, can you help me out? I found someone younger that I like better. I want to ditch this uh, old broad over here, get married to this new uh, girl. And the reason is we're related to each other, fifth or sixth cousins or something. And the pope would go, oh, well, we can't have that. Okay, you got an annulment. But the fact that she's the one who points this out and is the one who wants to initiate these proceedings was really mind-blowing for the time. And and that she was using male uh, 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 tools of power for her own gain uh, is something that is uh, truly remarkable at the time. Well, uh, and, and one thing to note here also is that everyone... Uh, was upset with her for trying to take this power. And they said that the reason that she was uh, so uh, uh, willing to go with her uncle Raymond is because she was having an incestuous affair with uh, uh, her They uncle. always blame them. They always uh, do that. That's, that's very common. Or yeah. they are uh, many other things that are not true. But anything they can do to sully their reputation yeah. whenever they try to use you know usurp any power or use their own power yeah that's even now now as amazing as this stand was it is still the 12th century uh so uh louis just takes her and (laughs) takes her to jerusalem uh, and they go to Jerusalem. The whole Second Crusade falls apart. The, nothing uh, of any major consequence uh, was gained from the Second Crusade. They end up back uh, over in France. Uh, that all happened 1147. Um, by 1152, she has had uh, three daughters. Uh, this, you know, not having any male heirs, uh, combined with um, she's uh, not fitting in very well with the Parisians. Um, the uh, the Aquitanians were much more, uh, in our eyes, would be considered much more progressive. It was a very, uh, we'd say maybe bohemian today. Uh, you know, again, courtly love, troubadours, art, creativity. The Parisians were actually very conservative and very stodgy and did not like all of the power that Eleanor was trying to wield and didn't like that she thought of herself as her own independent woman. And so eventually, by 1152, Louis uh, is convinced um, to go ahead and try and get the annulment from the Pope, and that happens. So that happens in the spring of 1152. Eight weeks later, 31-year-old Eleanor of Aquitaine Marries nineteen-year-old <gasps> Henry Plantagenet, 
Duke of Anjou. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. When she does this, their combined holdings create one of the largest kingdoms in Western Europe. Uh, their combined holdings went from the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain all the way to Scotland. Uh, so everything along uh, the, that Atlantic coast. Um, the, the, eventually, uh, so like two, two years later, Henry became Henry II, King of England. Uh, that was all due to Henry II's mother, Matilda, who was a person that we absolutely will have to talk about at a later point, because Matilda is another extremely strong, powerful woman. Um, but Henry becomes king of England, and uh, they have a very good relationship for at least 20 years. Um, Henry knew about strong and powerful women because of his mother and respected them. Uh, many times he would send Eleanor to different parts of his kingdom, and she spoke for the king. Her rules, her justice, her laws went out the same as his would, and everyone accepted that. Uh, eventually, she would settle back down in the Aquitaine and rule over the Aquitaine. That was her land. That was her home. But after 20 years, in 1173, um, Henry II didn't like sharing power. He didn't like piecemealing it. He liked sending someone on his behalf, but not so much divvying up his kingdom. They had had five sons and three daughters. Uh their son, Henry, uh, wanted to be king, wanted to exercise some of his power. And so he got some of his brothers together to try and overthrow the king. So try and overthrow Eleanor's husband, Henry II. Now, you're a mother. Which side are you going to side on? Your boys? <laughs> your sons? <laughs> or, or your husband? Well... I have to say that it all depends on which marriage we're talking about. <laughs> it all depends on, on and, wh and on which, which children we're talking about and which children, because I have to say well, there are some children that you're like, oh no, this is going to have to be put to rest. And then there's other children. Well, let me put it this way. There's other husbands that are like, oh, hell yeah, go ahead. Well, Eleanor sided with the children <laughs> and uh, wanted to help uh, them as much as, po uh, as, much as possible. Uh, she uh, was on her way to Paris to try and help uh, uh, her uh, son Henry overtake uh, Henry II, and she was captured by her husband's forces. Uh, she was put in a, a castle in England and held there as prisoner mm. for 15 years. Uh, the sons would continuously, uh, uh, you know, try and usurp their father. What's interesting is at the time, people looked at what she did as so horrible that she would try and, 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 uh, fight her husband with, 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 with uh, her armies, try and actually go against not obey, you know, not obeying her husband. There was one chronicler who said that, you know, sons going up against the father, we've found that at least 30 different times in history, but we've never found one example of a wife going against her husband. Uh, so she lived uh, 15 years uh, in, in, pr in prison, essentially, for doing such a thing. Uh, and then, in 1189, Henry II died. Her son, Richard, also known as Richard the Lionheart, uh, Richard assumed the throne. The first thing he did was free his mother uh, from prison. Uh, then... It's time for another crusade, everybody. Uh, we gotta, we gotta get another spring break trip going. You know, we have all of the battles and fighting and killing of innocent people at home. Let's go do that. Take it on tour. Uh, so Richard uh, goes for uh, crusade number three. He leaves in charge of his entire kingdom. His mother, Eleanor. Eleanor is the one uh, dealing out justice and laws and ruling over the entire swath of land from Scotland to Spain. 
Uh, in fact, as Richard comes back from uh, the uh, Crusades, he is captured and held ransom. She goes out and collects his ransom and then travels to have him released. The ransom was 30 tons Ooh. of silver. Uh, she had to raise taxes. She had to convince everyone to do their part, uh, to free their king, and they did. And they responded and, and gave as much as they could. And she got the 30 tons of silver uh, uh, to get Richard released. While all that was happening, their other son, John, had made a deal with the French king, lost some of their territory. Richard then went to fight to try and get that territory back. He was shot with an arrow mm. and died. Uh, Richard was Aww. her favorite son. Uh, even so, she John was her son too, and she made it uh, to made sure that while there were challenges to the throne, John would become the next king of England. Uh, and then, as king of England, she uh, would continue to help him to uh, uh, rule over all of this massive territory. It is uh, so striking what she did is that as soon as she did die, John's uh, incompetence as a ruler made it to where he lost over half of mm. all of that territory uh, as soon as she died. Uh, so she was really the one keeping all that together. Uh, King John uh, would go down in history as one of the most corrupt, one of uh, uh, the worst kings in English history. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to point out that uh, uh, whether, you know, this wasn't intentional, but the fact that Eleanor was so powerful and then gave all of this power to John, and John was so horrible with it, Eleanor being so good and right and just uh, John being not so would lead to the creation of Magna Carta. And from Magna Carta, you have there are now enshrined rights that leaders have to uh, respond uh, uh, to. They're not above the law. Leaders are up, they have to answer to the law um, that uh, uh, free men should be held in trial by juries of their peers. These things that would then go on to the English Bill of Rights and the Mayflower Compact and the creation of the United States itself can all really be traced back by the actions of this one woman. Uh, it, it is, uh, this is, again, one of the most remarkable people of the age and also one of the most uh, remarkable women. Uh, she died in the year 1204 at the age of 82. Wow. The uh, major themes uh, that she would fit into, uh, men fearing powerful women, um, and then blaming outcomes of their power on their sexuality. Uh, so, uh, you know, the whole idea of uh, her uh, trying to uh, go against Louis uh, because she was sleeping with her uncle. Uh, also, during... Uh, uh, when she ran, when she rose up against Henry II, people said that she was just jealous because he was sleeping with another woman, a uh, fair Rosamond, um, instead of just giving them their due as independent thinkers. Um, other themes uh, that war can lead to new agency for women. Uh, so the Second and the Third Crusade really show that Eleanor was able to exploit this time. Uh, uh, to gain power for herself, either as a leader of an army in the Second Crusade or literally running the whole kingdom while Richard was off on crusade. Um, and then, you know, the idea, and she is truly an example of women uh, directly expressing agency in a realm that is uh, completely dominated by men. So finding these ways and, and her intellect uh, uh, allowed her to exploit these ways to really uh, uh, wield power in this, you know, medieval times was not a, a, a very uh, progressive time period in regards to gender roles. Um, and uh, just to uh, finish off on this whole uh, lecture and, and, and uh, praise of this woman, uh, the whole reason that we are talking about her today is uh, all in uh, thanks to uh, uh, several powerful women in my life of course, there's you, uh, my mom. I would, uh, uh, I can recognize a uh, strength and powerful woman because of you. And yes, I think you two would be very good friends. 
Um, also, uh, I'm not a, a very good expert on uh, a 12, 12th century history, but the reason that this woman stood out to me is because of um, Dr. Lucy Kaufman over at the University of Alabama. Uh, she uh, talked to me about her uh, on several times, told me the story of her riding bare-breasted uh, into the Crusades, and that that's always going <laughs> to stick into your mind. So. Uh, this uh, th- this episode is very much dedicated uh, to Dr. Kaufman. Uh, thank you very much for all of the support that you've given me. Uh, so uh, with all that, are there any other insights uh, that now that you know who this is, that the chart uh, can make more sense All I can now? say is that it's all right there in her chart. I mean, it's very clear that she would have been the woman that she was. It's... Uh, a, an amazing um, thing, astrology, and I'm I'm like you know, I am sure that there are other astrologers that will be listening to this show and find many, many, many other things that connect. But um, in the amount of time that I have, with no prior knowledge or study, um, it 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 sounded like her. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah, I think the. Uh... You know, learning about leadership, learning about leadership and partnerships, um, you know, you see that in, you know, her first marriage and then her second marriage, uh, her, you know, home. She always returned back to the Aquitaine to rule over uh, her legacy, her, uh, uh, what she was supposed to, what her inheritance was. So all these words came up over and over again Mm -hmm. in her life, I think. You know, on our on our scale of right on the money to way out in outer space, we got another one. This is right on the money. This is very much explains who this woman was. And, you know, the healing part, uh, I mean, healing the masses, she was a just, by, through her justice and her leadership, she was able to mm-hmm. help the masses. Um, but maybe she had healing qualities in a, in a private sense with her mm-hmm. with her children uh, that we just don't uh, we don't mm-hmm. know so much about. It's very very interesting, lovely. I wish I could have known her, or at least have been somewhere near to just cheer her on. Of course, they probably would have stoned me then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So, uh, in conclusion, uh, thank you for uh, listening to uh, another episode of History in Retrograde. Uh, Please uh, like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, If you are on uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, please give us a rating. This is a podcast that's all about stars, so please give us those five stars. Uh, Leave a a written comment. Uh, You can reach us on uh, Gmail, uh, historyandretrograde at gmail.com. Uh, And uh, as always, in conclusion, if your houses are in order and the stars are aligned, everything will be Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Salile Creek Studio.